All right. Hey, good morning. It's uh, Thursday. Man, the week just gets wonky, doesn't it, when there's a holiday like 4th of July right on a Tuesday? And so you're thinking, man, it feels like this should be Tuesday, but no, it's Thursday. And so uh, life gets that way. It's another hot one here um, in Birmingham. And so uh, we have had some terrible heat indexes. Um, and, you know, just trying to keep my guys in my, in my work uh, hydrated and taking care of themselves and, and all that. So I hope you had a great night last night. We uh, we had a little Zoom call with uh, Ula uh, looking at some new products and how to just help people find balance in their life. And so uh, it's a really good system uh, we call a rebalancing uh, program. And so it's good. So we've enjoyed that. And uh, so we had a part in that Zoom call last night. And then uh, I've been spending my days, I know I teach in Luke on the, in the mornings, um, I, on Joshua on Sundays. And then uh, personally, just me, I'm working through different things. I'm doing a fast read through the book of Acts, making lots of notes, um, just making observations. So I'm not trying to understand the text. We've done that, broken it down. Just sometimes when you just read a passage looking for something, um, and so... Primarily, I was looking at what what did the uh, what does the New Testament church look like? What were the components of those things? Uh, and so you do a fast sweep. You think in terms of who were the leadership, what were they called, what was their role, uh, what what were they encouraging the people to do or not to do? Uh, unless you study the word like that, you can end up with some really uh, kind of janky type theology. And so, just wandering through that. Um, doing a little bit of work on leadership, uh, male and female roles, and things like that. So it's just been interesting for me. I've enjoyed my studies. Uh, I, if you can't tell by now, I'm, I kind of I study. I, I love to do that. It's it's just kind of innate in me since uh, my college days, actually. And so um, I was sitting, I uh, had an opportunity to sit with uh, John MacArthur in a small group and listen to him talk and ask some questions. And one of the things he said uh, and whatever you think about John MacArthur, he's a student of the Word. And one of the things that he said was, um, he said, I made a commitment when I got into ministry that I would study at least 40 hours a week. And uh, he says, the well's a little fuller now. And I think, man, a little fuller. Man, you, you're overflowing with information. But I took that to heart and uh, and try to do that myself. Even working, I spend a lot of time uh, studying the Word. So I don't know where that's coming from, just kind of chatting with you. Hey, let's jump into some truth, man. We are in Luke chapter 2. We're going to finish it up today, uh, and then we're going to begin to see uh, the beginning of the ministry. So we'll see John the Baptist uh, Monday and kind of just see what's taking place there. Luke is on a mission to make sure we understand that, that there were plenty of witnesses to experience and to see uh, Jesus. And so this one, we I'm assuming... Um, Luke got directly from Mary, um, because really there's only Joseph and Mary who are involved in this situation with Jesus, and he's 12. It's the only words quoted that we have of Jesus in the first 30, <coughs> 30 years of his life. We're going to look at that today. Um, but so, so Luke has been doing his journalistic investigative reporting, and he's put together this stuff. So he's looked at all the other Gospels, he's interviewed eyewitness accounts, and then he's making a meticulous thorough uh, reason to look at Jesus to prove that he is, in fact, the Son of God and that there's uh, substantive historical evidence of that. And so that, that's his goal. So we're, uh, we're in verse 41 is what we're going to be looking at today. So uh, we saw that after he was born and after his circumcision and all of that, that it simply says about his life from around two years to 12 that he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God. Now we come to the fact that he's a 12-year-old boy. So he's spiritually mature. He's been growing for those 10 years uh, in, in wisdom and in um, uh, knowledge. I mean, growing uh, physically and in, in knowledge um, and all of that. And so this is this is where... We find himself, he was growing and becoming strong, so 10 years of just developing as a carpenter's son and all of that, increasing in wisdom. That is, he knew things, he knew everything, but to, uh, to have knowledge to apply it to a human na I mean, a human body gave him wisdom. That's knowledge applied, and so he was gaining wisdom. He was increasing in wisdom <clears throat> and favor 
uh, of God was upon him. Then it says, verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So here he is. He's a spiritually, he's spiritually mature. He's growing. He's, he's observed and experienced life, and he's gaining wisdom. He's growing physically. He's a pure and holy, sinless servant. This is what he is. He's never done wrong a day in his life. Uh, and so he's got a history that his parents are, are aware of. Now, he at this point, he, he knows who he is, right? I mean, he's he's studied the scriptures. He <coughs> he's, he's gained wisdom. He's gained insight. He knows why he came. He knows who he is. And so it's important that we know that. So he's 12 years old. The setting is the uh, 15th of Nisan. That's when Passover is. Uh, and, and it syncs with our resurrection day. That That is the Passover of his, with his death was Passover. <coughs> so it was around April. Could be March, but it was, you know, because ours will fluctuate sometime like that. Um, and Passover is a one-day event. There are three basic holidays that the Jews celebrate every year. This being one of them, Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles, those were the biggies. Um, most every family was encouraged to come to the Passover. Not all were able to come every year, but this is how it goes. So it was one day event and then followed by seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it's kind of an eight day holiday and you would travel to Jerusalem. So they have a caravan. There's a lot of people from Nazareth that's going down. So they're in this caravan, and and uh, you know if you if you kind of study some of that and look at Jewish culture and all that, they would it makes sense to me. They would put the kids in front, and then the women and the men in the back, um, so that the 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 uh, duration of it would be dependent on how fast little legs could carry walk, uh, whether they all walked or they rode in carts, whatever it was. There was a lot of walking in that eighty mile trek, and so it would take several days to get get where they would go. Uh, three days average, I think, is what people would say. That's what that was. So the feast is a memorial service, and you know this. So I'm just saying this by way of reminder of God as deliverer and savior. Right? Passover is all about uh, that. So there would be a, there would be a sacrifice. So uh, Joseph and his family had a lamb that they're carrying uh, carrying down there. So you get this caravan, no matter how many people were in it, and it's a bustling, long kind of a deal, right? Animals and lambs are all over the place, bleeding. You've got men and you've got women. You've got children. They're playing in and out, probably running from one family to another. You know, the kids and just kind of mingling and, and darting around and just all kind of staying together in this caravan. Uh, so when they get there, there's going to be a sacrifice. He'll take the lamb. Joseph will, and no doubt his children would go with him, and they'll take the sacrificial lamb to the to the priest, one of the priests. All of the priests would be on location at Passover. So all of the 24, uh, you know, variants of that uh, would be would be there. <clears throat> so they would be sacrificing these things. So there would be the sacrifice, which would be the slaughtering of that lamb, the scattering of the blood that would be on the altar and dripping down it. <clears throat> they would take that lamb then, <clears throat> take it back to wherever they were residing, usually if the, somebody's house, a, a friend or relative or whatever. They would roast that uh, lamb. They would eat that lamb, and they would tell the story of the Passover and speak of the death angel, the deliverance from death and bondage. It was a huge celebration. Uh, all, by all accounts, there would have been at least 225,000 uh, sacrifices that were going on there in that temple area. Uh, Joseph would have brought their lamb, uh, you know, and all of that that would have taken place. <clears throat> so Jesus would see all of this. Uh, and I'm assuming he probably has seen it for the past 12 years of his life. They were devout people, Joseph and Mary. I'm assuming that they did these things. So um, he's 12 years old. Uh, at 13, <coughs> uh, that's when there's that rite of passage, this custom that still is today. And it was then. There's no reason to doubt this, uh, that he would be accountable to God for himself. You know, we... People ask about well, when's when's an age of accountability? When does someone you know become accountable for their own sins and all of that? Well, at birth you become accountable for your sins. Um, but um, you know, so if a kid dies before twelve, does he go to heaven? Those are all the questions people talk about. Um, here it was their custom. That's what 
bar mitzvah. Now, bar mitzvah, I don't think was a term in Jesus' day, but it, it is today. And a bar mitzvah means son of the law. It was a rite of passage, and it would happen at 13. Uh, you would become a man by all physical rights in that sense. So now you are responsible for your sins. Up until then, the dad, that's why it would be Joseph who would be taking the sacrificial lamb and all of that. And he would still do that on behalf of his family. But now it mean, it would mean more to a, a 13-year-old because it would mean that that was actually caring for his sins. At, you know, and that's what that would mean. So he's no longer a child. The scripture calls him a boy now in verse 40. It was the child grew. Now it says uh, the boy Jesus uh, went up. Uh, verse 43. And so he's now a boy, one year shy of being considered a man uh, in the Jewish culture. I, I realize that's foreign to us. A 13 year old, we, 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 it's hard for us sometimes to think of a 23 year old as a man, the way our culture is going, right? Uh, they're just boys who shave. <laughs> there's, there's an adolescent, some would say, that goes to 30. It's just called laziness. It's not called, it's not adolescence. Adolescence uh, is, is, you're just you're just lazy is what happens in, in a lot of men these days, and I digress. So this is the fact that at 13 in this culture, you you were considered a man. You would you would be working. You would be uh, doing all the things. You you're responsible for your own sins. You were by all shape ready to live life. So. Uh, Here's what happens. Let's just read it. I don't think I've read the text yet. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they re were returning after spending the full number of days required, <clears throat> that would be the eight days, <clears throat> um, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware of it. So they've gone to this thing, all of that. I mean, they had their big rah-rah, celebrated, enjoyed, had the, the spiritual aspect of it, the the emotional aspect of it, all of that was going on, and now they're heading out. And so you just assume that, you know, everybody's looking around, and then off you go, uh, that Joseph, I mean, that Mary, uh, that Jesus is somewhere with some of the kids, relatives or whatever, and you're just on your journey. Now, you would think, well, man, what a what a terrible, unresponsible, uh, you know, mother and father they were. But those things happen, right? I mean, um, you know, <laughs> Tammy and I both tell story. Tammy... <laughs> was forgotten at church a lot of days simply because there were two families that rode together and it was in a station wagon and there were like a hundred of them in there right and so you know somebody gets left Tammy was the quiet one she did I remember loading up a couple of vans and taking kids to Six Flags and coming back and made all the count and everything and by the time I finished counting on this van I went to the other van to get in it and one of the kids in the van that I had just counted said hey don't leave I'm going to the restroom told somebody in the van who didn't tell anybody else we had off and then we're looking around realizing we had left the kid. So those things happen, and it's not because you're not responsible. It just kind of is what it is. Maybe he was in a group, and she saw them, and then went up to gather with the women and let him hang with the kids, and then he just decided to stay back, right? <clears throat> so don't so make much of that, but this is what was going on. So it says this in verse 44. In, uh, instead, they thought he was somewhere in the caravan, and they go a day's journey. And then began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. So, you know, they got friends and <coughs> family and and they've got all of that going on. And so, you know, they're about a day's journey into this thing, you know, maybe the end of that day. And they're like, hey, you know, let's, you know, break for camp or whatever. So let's go find Jesus. And he's nowhere to be found. Now, I'm assuming that he had his brothers at this at this age. There were probably others. And so, you know, they're assuming that somebody, you know, James or Jose or uh, Jude, Simeon, one of the sisters <clears throat> caring for him, you know, every he's kind of looking out for them or whatever. Well, all of a sudden he realizes that he's not with them. <clears throat> so it says instead they thought he was somewhere in the caravan, verse 45. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they find him in the temple. Here's this 12-year-old boy. He's wandering He's there for three days, running the streets. Is he in the temple? Uh, what's he eating? Where is he sleeping? Those are curious questions that I have. Maybe the priests were like, uh, or the teachers of the law were like, hey, you know, you can stay with us. Or or maybe he maybe he had relatives there, and they're like, hey, well, your parents will come for you, so you can stay here. We, we don't know what happened, but somewhere he, he found a place to sleep. He was eating. Maybe he did what he's always done, right? It, it says he, he had nowhere to lay his head, right? Um as he was as he was a, a, a man. So potentially that's what's going on. Thousands of people would have been in that temple area. 
the crowd would have mostly gone home, but still there's that lingering effect. It's been 11 days since Passover, and uh, they're wondering where he is. So even if they make it to the temple, which is where they find him, where did they search? You know, did they go to the relatives' homes? Hey, is he here? You know, where would they? Where would you go? Um, and so they make their way to the temple. That would still be like trying to find your kid who's at Six Flags. Disney World maybe is a little bigger than that, but you know, just like you're trying to find your kid in this huge crowd, bigger than a mall. It's not like you know we're just talking this huge. And so they're trying to find him. Now this is what it says. Um, when Joseph and Mary saw him, they were bewildered. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Um, <clears throat> so here's what they do in verse 46. I'm sorry, I missed this. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, this is 12 years old. You're going to hear that phrase, and they were amazed at his teaching seven or eight times over the course of his time that we read about in the Gospels. It's a common thing. Blown away by this, by Jesus, who, who was an untrained individual, uh, as well as at 12 years old, he was as well. So he's sitting amidst the teachers. So all of these teachers would have come, rabbis, whatever you want to call them, they would have come to uh, the place as well. And so they just, they're teaching their people and other people would gather to hear what he has to say. Call these breakout sessions, if you will. But there would have been a bunch of these in the temple area and different rabbis would be teaching different things, mostly about the Passover, I'm sure, and explaining that to their, their understudies and all of that. And so Jesus just goes in the midst of them. And so the teacher is usually sitting down. That's how they did in those days. And people are standing around, and here's a 12-year-old boy asking questions. And then the, the reasoning way in which this thing goes is that they would then ask questions in, in reply. Rarely did they give an answer. They would, they would just ask, answer, ask his, answer his question with a question. And Jesus is giving them answers. And so they're like, everybody's blown away by this. So, so this, is what's, this is what's going on. So it's Jesus sitting in the midst of all these teachers, the experts in deal. And he's asking questions, and he's giving answers, and he's reasoning, and it's a type of learning. And the key phrase that keeps popping up is everybody's amazed at his teaching. Now, these are the only words that we have of Jesus recorded before he's 30 years old coming up here. Verse 48, when Joseph and Mary saw him, they were bewildered. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. So she's going to do what any mother does. What is wrong with you? Why did you do this? I mean, you know we're looking for you. What were you thinking? So here's where he says. I don't want to make too much of this, uh, you know, aspect of, of all that. But I mean, my mind thinks he, the boy's never done anything wrong. Why, why now are you going to treat him like he's like a scoundrel? And, and I'm sure they weren't. It's more concern. And it's what parents do. And so that's what she does. So she, she said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he says to them, why is it that this, these are the only words we have of Jesus until he's 30 at his baptism? Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Those are the words that he says. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know I had to be in my father's house? Now, this is going to be the beginning of that separation, which Mary knew was coming. Mary knows that her soul is going to be pierced and all of that. You know, and, and so she's realizing that he is her son, but he's not her son, right? I mean, he is her son, but his father is God Most High. And so this is him reminding her that, hey, listen, I, I'm on a mission. I, I am the Messiah. I am going to be in my father's house because that's where I should be. And I'm going to be challenging and asking questions of these teachers because it is my father's house, and they are doing my father's business, or at least they should be. And so this is what's going on. And he said to them, why is it you were looking for me? Did you not know I had to be in my father's house? And yet they, they on their part, did not understand the statement which he had made to them. So they're just a tad confused about what is going on. Because you know, it's easy to get into the day-to-day -day grind, and, and you forget that, oh, yeah, he's the Messiah. You, you maybe forget a little bit about what Simeon said, what Anna said, what... You know, the angels, you're busy living life, right? And so all of a sudden it's like this reminder, oh yeah, 
he's not ours. He he is the, the king of kings. And so it says, uh, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued to be subject to them. So he didn't break away like, hey, leave me alone, man. I got my own thing going on. He was just explaining to them that this is what is going to be the custom of his life. And so he's still subject to his parents. So you do that until you're married. At that point, when you find a wife, you leave your mother and father and cleave to your wife and you become one flesh. Up until then, you kind of stay where you are. And even in that betrothal period, you would go prepare a home somewhere on your father's estate and then you would marry and you would live in that kind of a deal. That's how it went. And he continued to be subject to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And then it says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature, in favor with God. Now, up in... Uh, up in the other verse, um, in verse 40, it says, that's all it says. This one adds one more line, and people. Kept you a little too long today. Lord bless you. Have a great one, and I'll see you Monday.